Okay, so we're going to start introductions after after this, but the um, the quote. Who would like to read the quote today? Savannah, please speak up. <laughs> History will be kind. I will. Yep. History will be kind to me for I do the right it. Winston Churchill. All right. So I've already been asked why we skipped to World War II. Why would I be skipping to World War II for the quote for Chapter 16? Woo! I think somebody just earned some extra credit points, perhaps. We don't give me any extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're right. I don't. I don't give you any extra credit points. Um, however, <clears throat> however, that was a good answer. And yes, that is exactly why I put that there, because it makes a difference, doesn't it? We talked about it, and we talked about it from the very beginning. We talked about it last semester. We talked about it in the in the introduction for this semester. It makes a difference because. What are the questions that I've asked you all to remember to ask whenever we discuss history? Who? Why? How? Where? Where? What? <laughs> what? When? When? Context. Context. Exactly. In atmosphere. Here, here goes <clears throat> Sir Aiden. Okay, so yes, context. Put it into context when you can because the history written from the southern perspective and told from the southern perspective is dramatically different than the history from the northern perspective told from the northern perspective, isn't it? Right? Same, pe same people, same families, right? brothers and sisters fighting on both sides, and it changed history, its perspective, okay? And what was left out, especially what was left out. That's one of the questions that people in history today and throughout the media today and in, in scholarship today are asking, well, this was left out, so this is valid history or this is invalid history, right? I mean, have you heard that in the news, referring to different subjects? I see a couple nods. Yeah? Okay. So it's very, again, it's very important to always question what you're reading and who wrote it, what they wrote, and what did they leave out. All right. So we left off on chapter 16. Let's see. We did the map. Sorry, the IT guys were in here and they were um, they were using this computer, so everything that I had up got moved around a little bit. Okay, we had talked a little bit about Reconstruction governments, Republican rule. We had talked about um, counterattacks and the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan and the Enforcement Acts. Okay, who can describe what kind of counterattacks there were in from the South? Who can describe some of the uh, counterattacks that occurred from the South and in the South? Counterattacks, like, as onto, onto who? Onto people or government? Yep. Or onto black, like, black people? All the above, Robin. Um, <coughs> and Savannah said... Well, the black codes. The Ku Klux 
Cook's plan, they would uh, they intimidated voters, um, mainly you know, all like all black voters. They would, I mean, just all sorts of different things. And they would they would get them before they even got to the polls, mm-hmm. and then once they got to where they were voting, and then it all then obviously it even went past that, where they started lynching them and hanging them, and you know, on and on. Mhm. Exactly. Yeah, they couldn't testify against whites. I'm sorry, I didn't even hear that. Ah, coerce them into lifelong contracts. Ah, coerce them into lifelong contracts. You know, um, as a former debt collector, <laughs> things aren't very far off in some ways. Uh, in contracts, especially. And contracts, well, especially for people who, one, can read, but two, don't read. Okay? So it was different for the blacks because most of them could not read. However, those who can read should read contracts. Can I reiterate that for all of you? Should read contracts. Anything you sign, you always read. Okay, a little soapbox. <laughs> Remember, I had I, I used to have to do the repos. <laughs> I I was attacked by pit bulls and oh, it was just glorious. It was a glorious time in my life. <clears throat> However, the Ku Klux Klan was started by six former Confederate veter- veterans in Tennessee. And it became, it was started as a social club, but it became a, an organization that was really used and targeted blacks and the freedoms of blacks, okay, to abridge some of the freedoms of blacks, okay? And this is because the Democrats in the South had waited to really counterattack um, on the North until after they were readmitted into the Union. Once they were readmitted into the Union, they had that security, okay? And then they started abridging rights. They started um, revoking rights. They started, um, you know, negating uh, laws. They started throwing or luring scalawags over to the Democratic Party. They started really undermining all of the Republican policies and procedures that have been put into place. Okay? How'd that go over in Congress? Not not well? <laughs> Nicholas, that was Brian. He said he created a lot of tension. <clears throat> They're laughing at me because tension is a popular word that I use. It's a it's a very good word. It describes a lot of uh, issues and response to issues. So <clears throat> what they did, and if you remember, does does anyone remember um, General Forrest from the Civil War? The Confederate General. He was the founder of the Ku Klux Klan, um, but he was also the one in charge of murdering all of the Union black soldiers who surrendered to him at, uh, and I forget which fort it was, but there was a, uh, a regiment of black soldiers who had surrendered and he was in charge of killing them, massacring them. So, um, <clears throat> You can see where where his focus and his um, yeah I guess where where you would call his focus lies. So <clears throat> the Republicans in Congress came back with three enforcement acts that were passed in between eight, in 1870 and 1871. Okay, the first one protected black voters, right? Because they were getting they were being terrified. Right? They were absolutely being terrified. And then uh, there was federal supervision in southern elections. There was a lot of fraud. Um, 
they were trying to implement different things like um, property taxes and a requirement for property in order to vote, right? Which abridged those rights. It didn't actually. It didn't negate those rights because they wouldn't go that far, or they would lose their representation in Congress. Remember, right? Yes. So they wouldn't go that far. However, um, they circumvented the the laws, and so the Republicans came back with these enforcement acts to try to put the uh, put the stops to it. And then you had, uh, the third one was the KKK Act, which strengthened those punishments from those who were um, preventing blacks from voting. All right? And it was a really serious issue at the time because, you know, if you're threatened with your life, you're probably not going to vote. This is one, <clears throat> the KKK Act is similar to um, what, is happening in certain areas of the world, correct? Yes? Okay, so it, tell me where else in the world you see something similar. Nicholas or Robin? As for intimidation to voters? Yes. Um, recently I saw in, oh, I can't remember if it was Nigeria or was it one of the countries in Africa, mm -hmm. which there's a lot of them. <laughs> Very true, <laughs> good. They're, they're, they're... <laughs> good one, Robin, good one. <laughs> yes, and so what they do to help enforce that and to help Voter, eliminate voter fraud is the UN will send in special voting delegations and they will oversee the elections, right? In some of the states here recently, you've seen some oversight in certain areas. It's very controversial in the United States because each side claims that the other is overstepping bounds and that there are a myriad of, of issues that arise from, from that type of thing. However, um, there are instances where it's very sketchy as to whether there is voter fraud or not. When 100% of a precinct comes in for one candidate, that's pretty unusual. Okay, it, No matter where you are in the world. Okay, um, unless there's some sort of coercion or it raises questions about coercion or voter intimidation. Or voter intimidation. Um, Wasn't that kind of what happened during the um, during when Bush when George W. Bush was elected? Um, it's happened then. It happened with Obama. It's happened with multiple in, in multiple presidential late elections of late. <coughs> yes. Okay, any questions? Okay, an important part of the KKK Act is that the writ of habeas corpus was suspended. Now, does anybody know when else the writ of habeas corpus was suspended? Lincoln suspended it. Yes, he did. When did he do it? He did it when his troops, his Union troops from Massachusetts, near Brook Farm, Massachusetts, came down and they were going to defend the Capitol. Coming through Maryland, it was the first skirmish in Maryland. He eliminated the, he suspended the writ of habeas corpus and brought Maryland into the uh, Union fold, really. Okay. The result of that was Maryland swung to the Union, okay, which was uh, a very strategic move on Lincoln's part. But the writ of habeas corpus 
is one of those important uh, instrumental integral parts of our government. What is it? I'm sorry? Okay, unlawful imprisonment, a little bit more. It means that you have to have, you have to have um, a court order requiring the, 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 the detainer of a prisoner to bring that person to court and show cause for his or her detention. Yes. Yes, you have to you have to actually bring them to court and charge them. You can't hold them indefinitely. Which is why Guantanamo Bay is one of those issues that brings up that because they ha they don't have to be charged in Guantanamo Bay. Okay? <clears throat> okay. Well, here, here in the state of Alaska, we have, I, think, I think it's called Rule, 40, Rule 47, which has been a lot of cases within the past couple of years since that was passed that um, there's been a lot of cases that could have been charged or could have been could have got conviction that have actually been dropped out of court because they weren't brought in like the rule 47 says that they have to be, be that this, the state of Alaska says that you have to be um you have to be charged within so many days okay i i'm not familiar with that but Yeah, it's just an extension of their habeas corpus in here in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. All right, so you have these things going on. You have the Enforcement Acts, and then you have the blacks who are confronting freedom for the first time. Okay? And what are they doing? They are marrying. They are moving. They are looking for their families. Are they moving great places? You know, uh, <clears throat> far and wide? Most of them don't. Most of them stay close to where they were because they have the family unit. Oh, if they move, they're moving. Some would move further west, but that's only a few thousand. Um, they really were looking for that stability. Most of them, of course, and I think we, we already talked about this, where they're moving maybe from the plantation where they were sla enslaved to, say, a neighboring plantation. All right, um, just for a, a little bit of dip, distance. Uh, some moved into the city, so there was there were issues with that. You know, there were there were issues. So you have this entire population, and where are they going to go? Well, the black codes say, well, this is where you're going to go, or this is where you're not going to go. But they still are able to decide if they want a family. They can decide. If they want to um, have the wife work, they can decide on some of the basic human, um, I guess, human, what they would call human rights for themselves, okay, and the first time. So if you have a group of people who have only known one thing, you can imagine how long or how difficult some of that change may be, right? Getting used to, from one system to another can be, uh, can be difficult. And it's obviously difficult for the whites to change the viewpoint and perspective on the system that they'd had uh, for several hundred years, right? Right. Okay, so <clears throat> the, let's see. There was a big growth in African American institutions like African American churches and churches like the African Methodist Church that was founded in Philadelphia, right? Absalom Jones. You have um, you have black schools which are now playing crucial roles in this freedom and this this new system of living right and blacks are starting these schools not many blacks have the ability to read and write because again it was illegal to teach them right okay so you have blacks who are starting these you have uh, the Freedmen's Bureau 
that is now coming in and supporting them. You you have the Freedmen's Bureau who's bringing in some teachers and and uh, helping with that effort. So <clears throat> I think it's in this chapter. Is it in this chapter or the next one that shows the percentage of blacks and the it must be in the next chapter and the uh, the educational rate and you can see where it's gradually climbing gradually climbing okay now there we go thank you okay so by 1869 there were 4,000 black schools you also had some black universities like Howard University in Washington DC is one of them all right so the um, so the schools, they were public schools, they were segregated, right? Yes, they were most certainly segregated. So, what does that mean? Right, whites and blacks are separated. What? Go ahead, Robin. Okay, so... <laughs> okay. So whites and blacks are separated. And <clears throat> the schools generally, the black schools, are underfunded. The South is now being hit with these major taxes because they're rebuilding infrastructure. So you have these, these governments, these Republican governments, that are focusing on infrastructure. They're now paying for black schools. So... You can see where the Democrats and the white population is um, is gaining tension, with growing tension, uh, and not exactly pleased over the way things are being spent, especially now that some of them who've never had to pay taxes have to pay taxes. All right. All right. So. The um, the whites were rejecting a lot of different things. They didn't want uh, interracial marriage. They um, well, they didn't they didn't want any type of of combination society. They wanted it completely segregated in most cases. All right. So the um, Civil Rights Act of eighteen seventy five was passed. Um, Charles Sumner, who was of what fame on the uh, on the Senate floor? Anybody remember? This is during the Civil War or right before the Civil War? The, the first school integration? Char well, he was. He was a radical Republican. And it wasn't necessarily about integration, but he wanted emancipation. And he was bit, beaten on the floor of the Senate so badly that it took him three years to recover. Okay? So he was out of the Senate for three years. He came back, and this Civil Rights Act of 1875 was passed after he died. And it desegregated the transportation facilities, juries, and public accommodations. So, so yes, the desegregation in some, um, but it wasn't, it, this one didn't do this uh, schools. Okay? Can I take a name about, about the Civil Rights Act? So that Civil Rights Act, like, okay, my, my, late, my late husband was from Georgia, and he remember him telling me this in the late, the late 1960s, he remembers when he was called, they were called, like the whole school was called into, he was white, um, the whole school was called into an assembly and, and he said he remembers them telling him that they had to start, that the, that they had to start going to school with the Negroes. So to me that was like really defining, I'm like, what? Like, so in this, you know, they're just in, as, as late as 19, almost late, like 1968 he said, that Georgia still had segregated schools. Wasn't that still right? That's supposed to stop that. Well, it didn't. This one, Sumner was for the 
the desegregation, um, but it didn't address the schools, this one of 1875. And it wasn't until the civil rights uh, movement in the 60s that schools were segregated, or uh, integrated, sorry. So uh, along with the, does that answer your question, Robin? Yeah. Okay. So along with this information, with the, the whites, the, um, these elites were being uh, viewed in the black society. So if you were a teacher or if you had been a freedman or if you were a minister, you held a higher status in black society than others, okay? And some were working toward all black institutions, some were working toward desegregation, some were working toward, most were working toward economic uh, benefits. Okay? All right, so the impact of emancipation, again, we get back to land. And land is one of those important, uh, important assets that really creates a, um, a society that is seemingly independent, correct? Would you say? Is that an, a correct assumption? I see a few nods here. I think I see a nod from Nicholas. <laughs> it's hard to see you, Nicholas. You're, you're really far away. All right, so rural blacks really wanted land to secure some personal independence. And the freedmen's visions didn't materialize. There was no land reform, okay? There was some labor reform. There wasn't the, the gangs that they had worked on the plantations, but there were, some, there were some similar things. Then they had sharecropping where they tried a few different um, a few different economic systems. And sharecropping was probably one of the most popular. And that's where you get, say, a quarter of an acre, you work the land, and you give the landlord X percentage of your crops, okay? Or your profit. And so, in that respect, the landlord won and the sharecropper won because um, everybody got a little bit. A little bit of something. Now, what is often overlooked in sharecropping is that many of the poor whites from the South also were sharecroppers because many of them didn't have land either. Okay, remember the, uh, the Pine Barrens and the Yeomen. Okay, the Yeomen were further up into um, like the foothills, but you had a lot of poor whites who were landless or they had lost their land, okay, in the war. There were a lot of people who lost their land in the war. And not because the North had come in and taken it, but <clears throat> when, you're, when your economic system implodes, which it did in the South, and you don't have money to pay for your land, what happens? Yeah, you lose it. It goes back to the bank or it goes back to the, the lien holder, right? All right, so um, it was really difficult in this in this time period. The economic uh, viability of this time period was pretty bad, and you know they were, they hadn't yet uh, they hadn't yet crawled out of the debt. They had lost all of their slaves, all of their labor, and so they were trying to. They were really trying to feel their way and to figure out what they could do to build themselves back up, build their economy back up, build their families back up, build up um, their opportunities. Okay. Now, the Southern Homestead Act was uh, an act where you could homestead and you work the land. A, a homestead in general is you can get up to 160 acres, and if you work the land for 
five years and you live on the land for three out of those five years, then you can receive title to that land, the patents, right? Now, in the Homestead Act in the South, those, uh, those lands that were up for homesteading were very poor. And so it was very hard to actually um, to grow crops that would produce enough for you to, one, pay for the land or pay for your, your crops or pay for the labor that it took to, uh, to do that. Okay? So, <clears throat> also with the Homestead Act, it reiterated the fact that most people lack the capital for land and equipment. All right? And then the whites opposed to selling the land to blacks. So if you don't sell land to the blacks, what are, what are the blacks going to do? Where are they going to go? They see land as one of their economic opportunities. Right? Do people today see land as an economic opportunity? No? Not as much. Yeah, not as much as if you were a farmer and needed land, right? Right. Correct. Right. We don't think regular high school buy some land and stuff. Are not going to see the future. Really? <laughs> okay. I'm All right. Not caring, but the rest of the <laughs> And, the, and that could very well be a difference in age because land, um, you know, land is seen as being very valuable. And it today, especially in, in Alaska, I mean, there is a finite amount of land that is available. It's less than 1% of the total amount of land in the state is privately owned. Right? That's a, that's a finite amount. So sharecropping was the most widespread where... They would have 30 to 50 acres, and when they leased it, their share of the crop, usually 50%, went to the landowner. Okay? All right. But then you have um, a depression. Okay? So you've had a war. Your economy in, um, your inflation in the South was what percentage? 9,000%. Okay, during the war. <laughs> so your economy tanked, you owed money, um, you lost your slaves, drove you into a depression. It was not only the South that had this depression. Right? All of the United States went into a depression. When you go into a depression, when you go into a recession, um, it creates a different uh, atmosphere, if you will, for workers, for investing, for um, for survival. Okay, a lot of people go into survival mode. A lot of people on the lower end go into total survival mode. Right? Okay. So when you um, when you do that, and when you have a depression, that is one of the reasons that the blacks and the whites were driven into sharecropping. Okay? So, by 1880, 80% of the cotton states were in tenancies. Most of them were sharecropping. Right? And then you have the crop lien, where you have local credit networks, which brings you into almost a... a a cycle of debt that you're never able to crawl out of. Okay? So, <clears throat> you put a lien on your next crop, there's a 50% interest, all right? So you have to have a bumper crop in order to pay off that debt. Do you ever pay off the debt? Very rarely. Very rarely. Okay? So, by 1870, in 1877 there was some new agriculture, but um, there was land erosion, there was soil depletion, you have you have biological, ecological issues going on at the same time. Right? Because they've been growing cotton and stuff on the on the land and it's been um, it's been depleting the soil of nutrients and they're not using crop rotation. 
All right. So here's an example. Here's a great example of the movements and the barrow plantation between 1860 and 1881. You have tenant farmer residences in 1881, um, and you can see where they haven't cut down a lot of trees. They're using the the plains area that was available, but you can see they're pretty small plots, aren't they? I mean, it, you know, it's it's a basic map, um, but you have a lot of people on a lot of plots, and then look at how many of them are related. All right, you have Daltons, Daltons, Bryant, Bryant. Um, I like the one, uh, the one house is just named for Granny. Okay, and then you have Barrows. Now, go ahead, Robin. Everyone, sorry. That's okay. Okay, so the Barrow Plantation, a lot of slave owners would name, or the, the slaves would take on the slave owner's name, last name. So this is why you see the Barrow Plantation with Handy Barrow, you see Reuben Barrow, Omi Barrow, Peter Barrow, Millie Barrow, okay? Gub Barrow. So you'll see more than one usually from that plantation. So these are uh, former slave tenant farmers and it really took a few tries to get get it to work and use um, this one in particular. They had between 25 and 30 acres, half of them had cotton and the rest were um, in corn and vegetables. All right, so the next map is sharecropping. Okay, the percentage of share cropped farms by county. Look at that 35 to 80 percent. Look at South Carolina and those huge sections of South Carolina and Georgia and then upper Alabama and then over into Texas too. Huge blocks of sharecroppers. Okay, and then look at Florida. Zero to 12 percent. Okay. And it was um, due to many different factors. A lot of it had to do with the soil and what they what their main crop was. Okay, so new concerns in the south, in the north. Sorry. What? When was the uh, depression? Eighteen seventy. So yeah, about eighteen seventy three. So. You have new concerns in the in the north between this time. You have Grantism and the Gilded Age. Poor Mr. Grant. Poor President Grant. Does anybody agree that he's poor, poor President Grant? <laughs> people that Samantha says people that he picked weren't so um, weren't so good. And it was it was dubbed the Gilded Age because there were so many problems with President Grant and his appointees. He is not the only president who has had this problem. Trust me, you'll run into more. <laughs> but President Grant, uh, his his entire he was a great general, right? I think most people can agree that he was a really good general, but he didn't really have the political savvy to. Um, be an effective president, okay? And he really chose poorly in his uh, in his appointments. So uh, his terms were known for political scandals, party revolt, massive depression, and the retreat from the recon, uh, reconstruction policies. Okay, so he was for reconstruction, but. He wasn't the biggest proponent of Reconstruction, was he? Okay. He wasn't a radical Republican, was he? And radical Republicans were the major compo or proponents of, of the uh, Reconstruction policies. Yes? Okay. So he had run against um, Horatio Seymour, who was an arch critic of foe and a foe of Reconstruction. But Grant, um, why did Grant win? 
Yes, thank you. You and Garrick uh, both got it. Um, he was very popular. He just basically won the war. And remember, he had allowed all of Lee Lee's soldiers to leave with their horses and without any um, any treason, no no ramifications. They were just allowed to leave. Okay. So that, um, although the war wasn't the best, it could have gone much, much worse in, in that uh, defeat, right? All right, so you have the Colfax Union Pacific Profit Fraud. You have uh, the Whiskey Ring uh, with Babcock. You have the Secretary of War with the Indian land bribes. Um, but Grant, being... A, uh, a military of military ilk defended his um, defended his appointees and his subordinates. Okay, there were uh, Democratic boss payoffs in New York. Um, you have the Standard Oil and Pennsylvania Railroad issue. You know, just just keep adding. Um, and this in this grant this Gilded Age was termed by. None other than Mark Twain, and he discussed uh, these these opportunities, these self promoters. As um, it was between about 1870 and 1890. Okay, Grant did better in foreign policy than he did in domestic policy, because he settled the Alabama claims with Britain for 15 and a half million. Okay, 67. What happened in 67? 1867. Torin, you're sitting on it. Right. Woo! Yes! Aiden, if I gave extra credit, you'd get some. <laughs> yes, Alaska was purchased. Seward's Folly, right? Mm -hmm. Secretary of State, um, who had been William Seward, he had been Secretary of State under Abe Lincoln, right? Um, but it also rekindled expansionists' hopes. Okay? He also tried to annex the Dominican Republic for some Caribbean trade, but the Senate uh, rejected that. And um, by 1872, the Republicans thought that Grant's um, Grantism in the Gilded Age was going to ruin the, the party. Okay? But the liberals revol revolt. The Grants, Grants uh, critics formed their own party, which, was, which were the liberal Republicans, who were former radicals but had been left out of this prophet of Grantism. Okay? So <clears throat> when you split a party, what happens? Generally, they lose. Yes. So um, the Democrats backed uh, Greeley anything to beat Grant. <laughs> okay. So it's it's kind of uh, interesting. However, Grant still won fifty six percent of the popular vote and carried all the northern vote and most of the sixteen southern and border states. Okay. However, this because there weren't very many Democrats who were actually seated in Congress, you didn't have the issue with, it wasn't as, as big of an issue to split the party at this time. All right? So this division affected Reconstruction and basically killed Reconstruction. All right? So the Amnesty Act kept the liberals, um, it was to keep the liberals from a campaign issue, okay? And it allowed all but a few hundred ex-Confederate officials to actually hold office. All right, and here's the, here's the Alaska Treaty of Cessation, okay? Written, of course, in Russian, which I cannot read, but uh, 
here is <laughs> here's a little gem look at this canceled check it's written on there paid by the Treasury okay who would think that they'd actually send a check to Russia <laughs> to cash a check for Alaska the state of Alaska right <laughs> yeah it's a fascinating little um, primary source Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so you've got the Panic of 1873 because you've got uh, you've got a depression coming. Okay, Panic of course hits first, but with the accelerated industrialization and this uh, rapid economic growth and this speculation, you have people who over speculate, and you had John Cook from the North. Northern Pacific Railroad defaults and his bank which was the largest in the US sank okay um, when it shut down financial panic follows okay and then you go you head into a five-year depression all right not the first depression won't be the last will it but a five-year depression is is uh, pretty significant <laughs> It was a major depression. So, um, banks closed, farm prices plummeted, one in four railroads failed, right? 18,000 businesses went bankrupt, uh, 3 million people were unemployed in 1878. Pretty significant. I do not know. I'd have to look that up. Um, Yeah, I'd have to look that one up, Savannah. I don't know. She asked what the population was in the U.S. at the time. Um, it was large enough that the three million affected the economy dramatically. So it replaced sectionalism and divided both major parties because they had a problem repaying the federal debt. Okay? They, they had war bonds. They... Uh, which were bought out with greenbacks, okay? And people wanted gold in payment. So you had the, the Public Credit Act of 1869, which stated that payment would be in coin, but in the future, okay? In 1872, it was changed to gold only, not silver. So you have these issues with uh, specie, gold specie. And we've seen this from the beginning of the United States, where people are suspicious of paper money, okay? They um, would prefer to be paid in gold. During the Civil War, both the North and the South printed paper money, okay? And um, that's one reason that there was 9,000% interest because people just kept printing or not interest, excuse me, inflation. The, the government just kept printing the money and it made it less valuable. Okay? All right, so <clears throat> this Public Credit Act saved the public credit and the currency and brought some Republican unity to it. Now the Green Party, the Greenback Party, um, adopted the debtor's cause to keep uh, Greenbacks in circulation, but they really had... Um, little success but with these new concerns in the north the um, especially the economic concerns the priority of reconstructing the south was much less prominent and much lower of a priority to the north than when when the economy was good all right have you seen that before where when the economy is good, X, Y, and Z get done, but when the economy um, dips, then people go into more of a um, survival and they, they constrict and contract in their spending. 
and in social programs and in um, and in just cultural ways. Have you seen that? Okay. So this is what this is what happened. So the North is pulling. Yeah, the mutilation name was 2007-2008. Yes, yes, it did dramatically, didn't it? So um, you have the North pulling back from Reconstruction. Well, Reconstruction was making sure that X, Y, and Z got done for the blacks. You pull out, what happens? Nothing gets done. So when nothing gets done, who steps in to fill that void? How about the Southern Democrats? When the Republicans pull back out of the South, Southern Democrats come in and it's easier. Remember, they've been, they've been balking and they've been um, fighting, right? But when the, and the North was there. So the North pulls back, what happens to the Southern Democrats? They just keep going, right? And, but they're, it's a lot easier. I mean, the path is open now. Okay, so, and when I refer to the Democrats and the Republicans, I'm not trying to pick on a party. I'm saying that the majority of the people in the South, besides the blacks, were, the white citizens were mainly Democrats, okay? So it was their agenda that was being pushed forward. Okay, and at the time in Congress, the Republicans were the majority, and so their agenda was being pushed forward. And their agenda was about black emancipation and helping the blacks. And the white Southerners, um, it was almost the antithesis of what the white Southerners wanted, right? So, um, you are the only participant in the conference. Hmm, we just lost Robin. Okay. Luckily, we have uh, we have re video recordings. Okay, so <clears throat> the Supreme Court weakened actually Northern support for Reconstruction with Ex Part uh, Milligan, Texas versus White, the slaughterhouse cases. Okay, United States versus Reese, United States versus Cruikshank. All right, basically the the Supreme Court was dismantling Reconstruction policies. And without that, they couldn't enforce egalitarianism. Okay? Hi, Robin, are you back? Okay, so ex part Milligan in 1865, the court ruled that military tribunals couldn't try citizens or civilians in areas where civil courts were open, even during times of war. Okay? Yeah, I'm going to enter it. It's my fault. Okay. You missed, like, explanation that the Supreme Court weakened the Northern support for Reconstruction. So, in 1869, Texas versus White, where the Union was indissoluble, Okay, cessation was legally impossible, so Reconstruction was still constitutional. All right, but slaughterhouse cases was about the 14th Amendment, and the court only protected the national citizenship rights. They didn't protect the state citizenship rights. Okay, so you could abridge rights in the states as long as you didn't abridge their national rights. All right, and Reese and Cruikshank were about the Enforcement Acts of 1870, okay? In 1883, um, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was invalidated, all right? So, um, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 was also invalidated, all right? So, you have you have a lot of different things going on at this time, don't you? So you've got um, 
the general angst in the South, you have angst in the North, you have economic despair in a, during a depression, you have the Supreme Court who is undoing the reconstruction policies that took how many years to put into place and how many presidents, right? So there's, there's a lot of change and some of it is, is almost chaotic, isn't it? All right, so Republicans are in retreat. Now, it's a, it's a gradual retreat, but uh, Grant defended the Reconstruction, but believed in a decentralized government. So the military in the South was shrinking. The Northern Republican idealism was dropping because you have some of the radical Republicans like Sumner who died, right? They were, they were pretty old by this time, and they were dying out, um, you know, and, and attitudes change. So Democrats won the House in 1874, which was a political liability for Reconstruction. And then in 1875, most of the radicals had died out, and, and so they were backing off because radical republicanism was now being seen as something bad almost okay it had been popular for a while but then you start being viewed as bad okay and if you want to be uh, re-elected which is the goal of most politicians you're not going to choose that path okay and so uh, reconstruction was abandoned generally around 1876 and 1877. Okay? Um, Democratic influence kept surging, and redeeming the South was bringing the South back to um, where Democrats wanted the South. Almost a status quo, all right? Depriving Republicans of black votes and putting economic pressure and intimidation on them. Um, using the laws to ensure the stable black labor force. Okay, This is why in the 1870s you'll see this exodus movement where, um, where blacks who hadn't necessarily moved prior to this, 4,000 of them moved to Kansas alone during this time period because of this change and, um, and the change in Reconstruction. And that, and the redemption of the South, and the redemption of the South was a um, was a strong, strong movement in bringing back the pride of the South and the um, the pride in the Democrats in the in the party, and also bringing back power to that um, the whites of the South. Okay. Because at this time, <clears throat> they believed that blacks were inferior to whites. Even Republicans believed that blacks were inferior to white, whites. Okay, So the Democrats started winning more and more uh, elections. Okay, so the election of 1876, where both parties sought to discard the this animosity left by the war and Reconstruction. So you have the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes and the Democratic New York Governor Samuel Tilden. Okay. Tilden won the popular vote by 3%. However, the Republicans challenged the electoral votes in South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. Okay. Electoral votes were challenged in Florida most recently in a presidential election. And each claimed vic victory and each accused the other of fraud. So, <clears throat> you know, a little bit of angst when both parties are seen doing the same things and accusing each other of the same things, right? <laughs> and uh, the Congress had a special electoral commission with seven Democrats and what, seven Republicans and then one independent but the independent quit and a Republican was replaced. And so, who won? The Republican 
Yes, eight to seven. Split directly down party lines. Okay. Um, and then, however, the Democrats wouldn't wouldn't pass it without concessions. And this is important because these concessions um, further led to more um, abridgments of blacks' rights. Okay. They removed the federal troops from South Carolina and Louisiana, okay, where Democrats could again gain state control. They, in the South, the federal patronage and the federal aid to the railroads and the federal support for internal improvements came. Democrats would then drop a filibuster and accept Hayes as president if they agreed to treat him, it, treat freedmen fairly, okay? Now, did the Democrats uphold treat Friedman fairly? Nicholas, would you hazard a guess? Would you, um, what, what would be your opinion on the Democrats treating Friedman fairly after this election? Did they do it? Exactly. After the election, the text said that uh, the promises like that were forgotten. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. They were definitely um, they were definitely forgotten, and you know, Hayes is uh, Hayes pledged to ensure the freedmen's rights, but he really had little power left in the South. Any questions? Okay, so here's a map of the disputed election where you see Hayes, Tilden, and then Peter Cooper. And you can see where Tilden won the popular vote, 51% to 48%, but again, it comes down to electoral votes. But that's a tremendous um, split there in the electoral votes. That's really really close. I mean, obviously it's close. They had to compromise to achieve it. But um, that tells you that the, um, the tension and the split between North and the South and the regions is still alive and well, isn't it? This is, we saw that pre-Civil War and we're still seeing it today. Okay? You're right. You're right. They so keep drawing the lines. Yes. So right after the war, they moved to really quickly. And yes, and right before the war, they had remember they had found uh, gold in California, and that was one of the reasons that we went to war, is because there were um, issues with, you know, is it going to be a free state or not, and. Uh, the Oregon Territory, the and all of these. It's it is dramatic. Okay, any questions? Okay. Start here, chapter seventeen. Transformation of the Trans Mississippi and West. Okay. This map that you see on here is a map of the um, Indian reservations in the continental United States. Colors. Those are counties. The tiny lines on the map are the counties at the time. 
Okay. Wh where where are the colors? Almost all west. What's that? And generally larger, yes. Very good. There are a few in Florida. There are a couple um, up in Massachusetts and that, but you can see how small they are. I mean, you can't even see them, right? I mean, honestly, you, you just can't see them. You can see uh, the Navajo Nation out in Arizona and the Hopi and let's see the, where are some of the others? Pine, Pine Ridge, Pine Ridge? What is it called? It's not Pine Ridge, it's Pine something. Oh, Savannah, I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, that one is from the 2000s. Well, how many native tribes are there in the United States, federally recognized? Close. Close, 567. There was another one added in June of 2015, July 2015 in Virginia. Okay, 229 are in Alaska. Okay. All right. So this necessary price of civilization and progress. What's a necessary price of civilization and progress? Brianna, any ideas? Okay. Nicholas and Robin, can you hear Savannah? It's hard to maintain nomadic civilizations when lands are being developed, such as railroads, right? And um, industrialization, land speculators, okay, mining, farming, okay. So <clears throat> the West was really west of Mississippi, and the Rocky Mountains were known for their gold and the Great Plains, okay. And these were 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. They were fighting more with the natives again in these areas, in these regions, okay. So the development of civilization and progress really depended on the federal government and the troops because you couldn't um, expand safely without being attacked um, without the federal government troops, okay? But then you couldn't hold off your land. You can't keep people from, from encroaching on your land also without some sort of military might. So was it the federal troops who were defending you or was it yourself that was defending you? Yourself, if you were native, right. Right, the federal troops weren't, they, even if federal troops wanted to defend them, okay, and the treaties, they agreed to defend them, but they were ineffective in keeping settlers and gold miners and speculators and railroads off of these lands. Okay? So people were constantly encroaching. So um, the Homestead Act of 1862 also put a lot of pressure on these lands further west, on the, especially on the native lands. Okay? And then the Transcontinental Railroad, they were granted millions of acres. And I say millions of acres, right? Whole swaths of land wherever they wanted to go, basically. Okay? So, um, who was going to stop them? Was it the troops who were riding on the rails to get to the natives? No, it was the natives. So, you have this constant battle between the two. Okay? And it progresses and, and continues to progress. All right, so 
the Americans needed these new economic opportunities, right? Um, and with that came the the huge decline of the buffalo. Uh, the The Indian cultures were devastated. Um, the Indian cultures and the populations were probably the most dramatic and the most visible. Okay, you have you have photographs of wounded knee. Okay, you have stories of Custer. All right, these are very um, emotional and um, emotion building photographs and descriptions. All right. So <clears throat> the natives uh, who were living out west keep getting relocated further and further west. Okay, and this is why I asked you where those colors were, and you can see where some of them held held fast, like in the Midwest, but they just kept pushing further and further west. Okay, and and they kept being pushed further and further west. All right, the Cheyenne, the Lakota, the Sioux, um, you know, were some of the native tribes were actually pushing other tribes further west, okay? And then the federal government was enforcing reservations where you have a certain amount of land on which to live. And if you are buffalo hunters, if the buffalo aren't on the land that you have, that's, that's not their problem, okay? So if you didn't have food, um, they were supposed to provide food, but they didn't always provide food. They didn't always provide everything that was included in the treaties. Um, rarely did they provide everything or even some of the minimal things in the treaties that they had agreed to. Okay. By the 1890s, almost all natives were located on reservations. So the Plains Indians, you can see here some of the major Indian battles and Chief Joseph's Rood and the Bo Bozeman Trail. And you can see Little Bighorn, which is, um, you know, one of the more famous battles. Wounded Knee in 1890, uh, the massacre of Chief Dull Knife in 1877, uh, the Sand Creek Massacre, the Skeleton Canyon, uh, where Geronimo actually surrenders in 1886, uh, Red River Wars, in 74 and 75, okay? And you still have Indian territory, all right? You have Indian territory, um, which is basically Oklahoma. And then you have the, the map also shows where some of the tribes were, the, some of the major tribes. So you have um, a lot more tribes and this is where this is where scholarship gets sketchy because you don't always have the historic tribes like some of these tribes have been pushed west and moved the tribes who had always lived there further west or out of that region okay so there is no history of that and if there is a history of that most of it is going to be oral Okay, and some oral history is not spoken outside of the tribes, right? Okay, so you have, um, this is also one of those cases where what is, what is history and who, who writes it? Okay, so the Plains Indians, the Dakotas and the Montana um, south to uh, Nebraska, where you had the Lakota, you had the Flatheads, the Blackfeet, um, the Assiniboines, the Northern Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Crow, the Hidatsas, and the Mandans. And I know I don't pronounce all of these properly, I'm sorry. <laughs> you have the Central Plains, which was Indian Territory, which was Oklahoma, right? Where the five civilized tribes came from, or had been transplanted. Who were the five civilized tribes? Where were they from? Okay, the East Coast. They can call it the East Coast then. What did they call it? No. They, also, they actually called it the Southwest. 
Remember? That's what they had called it, is the southwest. Okay? And then you have the plains, rivers, valleys with the, Pine, uh, the Pawnees of Nebraska, the southern plains, where you have western Kansas, Colorado, eastern New Mexico and Texas, uh, the Comanches, the Kiowas, the Cheyennes, southern Arapaho, Apaches. Um, they often had a migratory life. Okay? But some natives were uh, farmers. Some of them were um, were migratory. Okay, they still saw this extended family ties, tribal cooperation. Okay, you still see it today. Consensus, especially among the Yupik. Right, it's the way that they um, develop and plan for the tribe. Okay, religion was extremely important in for the Native Americans. Um, was it always the Christianity? No, it wasn't always Christianity. The, um, most of the tribes had their own religion or they had, um, some of them had like the same religion, you know, the life of circles or the spirits from the sun dance or um, just various different tribes used or had different religious beliefs. But it was very, very important to them. And then, let's see, it's 122. We're going to get cut off here. So, next Tuesday, Thursday, oh my, I almost had it right. On Thursday, we're going to finish this chapter and start chapter 18. Uh, we'll probably only get through this chapter. Um, so make sure to read the rest of this chapter if you haven't already. And you can start 18 and be ready for the next one. Are there any questions? Okay. All right. Um, we're going to wait for Leah to do the introductions. I'm sorry we didn't get to do introductions today. We'll do that as soon as she gets back. All right. So I will see you on Thursday. Bye, Robin. Have a great day.